Good evening and welcome. My name is David Russell. I'm an extension specialist covering statewide weed management responsibilities. I cover corn, soybeans, small grains, forage pastures, and rights of ways. Just to tell you a little bit about myself, I was raised in Mississippi on a cow calf operation. Spent several years studying forage agronomy and weed science at Mississippi State University before coming here to Auburn University last July. So I have a great appreciation for the beef cattle industry and the land that we manage. And then our topic today is weed control in pastures. A few of the things I'd like to cover are the different components of our weed management strategies and forages. Go over a few definitions. I think it's always helpful to talk through scenarios that each of you probably face on a daily basis regarding weeds. I'd like to break those between broadleafs and grasses and then end by just sharing some ongoing research that our program is currently working on. So I realize that many of you here obviously are because you're part of the BCIA, you're a member or you have some association with this organization. So it's obvious that you have a vested interest in promoting Alabama's cattle industry. But this is just a reminder that your cattle herd, with all the genetic improvements that you're making, studying all the EPDs, they're only as good as the diet that they're on or the forage that they're grazing. Basically, your herd isn't gonna reach its full potential on poor forage. Many of us are cattle producers first and forage manager second. So I'm here to kind of encourage, not a complete flip of those roles, but to just stress the importance of forage management. So having good quality forage pastures is part of what creates this overall herd health because our forages really are an asset. And it's an asset like most, if neglected, it can depreciate. So I'd like to pose this question. What's the first thing that comes to mind when you hear the term weed control? Do you think of bush hogging? Does it bring back memories of hand pulling weeds in either your garden or your flower bed? Based on my conversations just the last few years, I'd argue that many of us think of herbicide use. You know, what can I spray that's gonna kill this weed? It's probably the most common phrase I hear. I get calls, I get texts, emails. They want to know, number one, what is it and how to kill it? But I would encourage you, rather than just looking for a simple answer that involves herbicides, let's look at a systems approach. We'll go through some of these rather quickly so we can get into the field scenarios, but I want to just kind of set the stage for what I mean by integrated pest management. In this case, we're talking about weeds, but it can mean any kind of pest like insect pest. But IPM, again, regarding weeds, it's basically an ecosystem-based strategy that focuses on long-term prevention of pest or their damage through a combination of techniques. And we emphasize that combination of techniques. So it's not just a herbicide solution for a particular weed. It's biological control, manipulating habitat, modifying your practices, and so on. So to start with, the first of about four components are, uh, is the preventative measures. Obviously, the name speaks for itself. These are measures that are going to prevent weed from establishing in a crop in the first place. And we're talking certified weed free seed, uh, we're cleaning farm equipment. And I just illustrate these by the, the pictures here. And if any of you have run a tractor bush hog through broom sedge fields this time of year, you know that the airborne wind dispersed seed are floating through the air and that will obviously catch on the front end of your tractor. Heaven forbid it's Kogan grass seed that are floating around in the springtime of the year, especially in South Alabama. We've all seen, you know, this center picture here where the grass and seed 
from clippings accumulate around the PTO there and on top of the bush hogs and other equipment. Um, here's another example, this picture on the right. Uh, this is actually a picture of myself. I'm in a uh, sand burr field site where we were conducting research and I was absolutely covered by this sand burr all over my uh, pants, my shirt, even uh, my snake chap. So I spent quite a bit of time getting this, these things off because I did not want to take these to another location. I know how hard it is to control some of those sand burrs. So these are just some examples, preventing weeds from spreading in the first place. Secondly, let's talk cultural practices. What do I mean by cultural practices? These are basically <laughs> techniques that involve maintaining field conditions such that weeds are less likely to establish, all right? I don't want anyone to expect that if you call me up or send me an email about a particular weed species that any particular herbicide prescription is going to work when you have fields that are over overgrazed or you have bare soil. So cultural practices are basically just crop rotations, um, grazing management, control burns, uh, proper soil fertility. You know, take these pictures for example. The one on the left, again, you can't expect herbicides to perform like they are designed to do on a particular weed population when there's no biological competition there to compete with any weeds that may be emerging. So it's no wonder that fields like this on the left that are overgrazed, you know, those are the type fields that we see buttercup come in in the spring, foxtail in the summer, and who knows what all else, uh, what other kind of weed species we see in fields like this. So proper grazing management, I hope you're already practicing that with your cattle herd, um, but, but always thinking about the leaving the proper forage height because that goes a long way by itself, just having a good forage canopy to compete against a lot of these aggressive weeds. And then when you combine something like herbicides in with that good, healthy forage stand, that, that um, works together even better. Mechanical, you know, I think these are obvious means of controlling weeds like tillage and mowing, uh, hand pulling. I know many of us enjoy getting on the tractor and bush hog and, um, running a bush hog across our field to make these three, four or five foot tall weeds go down to a pretty clean pasture really quick. But I want you to understand that this comes um, at a cost as well. Last year, ALDOT estimated mowing cost to be somewhere in that $40 per acre range. You know, I know many of us as managers don't necessarily consider our time uh, monetary value or, or worth a lot, but it does cost, you know, to run that equipment. Not only that, you know, it's removing a lot of our desirable forages at the same time. I'm not saying that something like bush hogging doesn't have a fit. It does for sure, but it needs to be incorporated and not relied solely upon as a primary means of control. Because when you talk, especially perennial weeds, like the, the brush species or, or dog fennel or anything like that, sure, you'll set it back or suppress it for a little while, but those perennial weeds are still coming back from roots. And so really you're spending that $40 per acre multiple times a year. Whereas if you combine that with herbicide or, or some other type practice, you could go, you can make your money work uh, uh, a lot better. Other mechanical forms, obviously a hoe uh, works well on species like thistle. Let's not wait until thistles get this big uh, late in the spring. Uh, realize that these biennial plants are emerging right now in the rosette stage. And so this is just an example of a good time to use mechanical control to target species like thistle. And then lastly, obviously, um, the chemical methods, uh, the use of herbicides, basically. And before anyone considers using chemical control, and many of you, I'm sure, already have sprayer systems that you utilize on your pastures, but there are several requirements 
I'll say several, there are four main requirements that I'd like for us to keep in mind. And these are key if you're gonna expect that herbicides are to perform like, like they should. And number one, we wanna identify what the weed is. You know, we can't prescribe any particular herbicide if we don't know what we're targeting. Next is proper herbicide selection. That's an obvious. We obviously wanna calibrate our equipment. We can make sure we get the right weed. We can um, pick our correct herbicide, but if we're not applying it correctly and that product isn't getting to the target as intended, then you've done no good. So, and lastly is to know your desired forage. So there are many herbicides that can do well on a particular weed species, but you know, I wouldn't advise anybody to go spray Pastor to target foxtail or Johnson grass in a tall fescue pasture. All right, so we're not gonna be happy with the results from our Pastor on tall fescue. That's just an example. So there are certain herbicides that are meant to be applied in certain forage species. Regarding weed identification, these are a few resources I'd just like to share with you. These are three main books that I personally keep with me uh, all the time. I go to them regularly when it comes to at least narrowing down a uh, particular plant species that I am uncertain of. Um, also, there are a couple websites and apps that I use. One is Southeastern Flora. This primarily focuses on the native plants of the Southeast, but um, it, it's got a good library of pictures um, with scientific names there that you can go to to at least help you narrow down. And then iNaturalist.org, that's an online website, and they have an app. I have found really good results from this. If I can take a really good picture of a particular weed and it's identifying parts from the field, I can upload those and it will give me a list, basically a short list of the possibilities for that particular plant. And it really helps me at least narrow down whatever that weed is, at least to a specific genus, if not the, the similar species. So those are, are good ones to keep in mind that I wanted to share with you. All right, now this is not by any means a complete exhaustive list of all the products available in forages, but it is most. So I show you this um, because what I found that is that if, if a producer has, a, has sprayer equipment to begin with, if, if you're sitting here thinking, sure, I, I, I'm familiar with some of these herbicides, I use some of these herbicides on my place. Um, if you spray anything at all in your forages, you're probably most familiar with at least two of these products. And you wanna guess which ones? If I didn't have this list up here, what are the two main herbicides that you are probably already familiar with? It's likely 2,4-D and Roundup. Most folks at least know those two. And then maybe Grazon next. All right, so my point is that just because you may have tried either of those, and your weeds keep coming back, that doesn't necessarily mean that it can't be killed. Understand that there are many factors involved when we're talking plant physiology and the use of herbicides. You have to consider the plant's life cycle. If it's a perennial or annual or biennial, you've got to consider environmental conditions. Did you mix the right amount? Uh, what's your sprayer output? Uh, did you calibrate your sprayer? Are you applying it properly? So it's not as simple as pouring a couple cups into a tank and knowing that your tank covers X amount of acres and just heading out and spray. There's some homework that needs to be done on the front end. And proper stewardship is, is necessary. Once you've identified the weed, you've selected your herbicide, you know your desired forage, you must be mindful of the fate of that herbicide. So in other words, it helps to have an understanding of the product. Does this herbicide have soil residual? Is it foliar active? Is it both? Is it only a pre-emergence herbicide? So, and I'm sure many of you are probably aware that much of the hay or manure from fields 
that are treated with Grazon Next or P plus D can affect sensitive broadleaf plants even months after application. Uh, just like this soybean in the picture, it, it was probably planted into uh, an old pasture that had a history of Grazon Next use. You know, uh, the picture on the right is a tomato plant or was a tomato plant. <laughs> Uh, where the landowner used mulch and either hay or man manure that was treated with Grazon Next and put that around his plants, all right? When that grass material begins to break down and decompose, then that product is still within those cell walls and it eventually leaches down into the soil. And it takes time to, for a lot of these products to degrade, either through rainfall or dilution or UV, uh, degradation. So knowing uh, what herbicides are using and, and stewarding it property is, is a, it goes a long way. And please don't apply herbicides like this. <laughs> uh, agriculture in general gets a black eye often from the general public who may not understand what we do. So we sure don't need um, anything like this, especially if you're near uh, the public um, in this case, you see the fines there in the, in the top, um, right up here in this area. These are driftable fines that are carried by the wind. In this case, the fines uh, from 2,4-D or dicamba drifted across the woodlot there and settled onto a neighbor's cotton field. And I can guarantee you it did not end well for that crop. So just be mindful and steward your products uh, correctly. This is the cluster nozzle from that application. If you have any of these, I would encourage you to go throw these away and get you a better boomless tip that will put the spray where it needs to go. Uh, there are definitely better boomless tips out there than this cluster nozzle. All right, so let's talk weeds. Uh, in the time remaining, uh, let's think about the weed issues in terms of broad leaves or grasses. In general, pasture weed control decisions are largely based on the visual thresholds and intuition. And this buttercup is a prime example. You know, we don't often think about buttercup control in our pasture until March or April in the springtime when the, our fields turn yellow. All right. So again, that's why I say it's largely based on visual thresholds and intuition. How many of us know that, you know, thistles are another example. Um, I wanna make you aware of some of these, you know, thistles can be treated now while they're at the rosette stage, rather than, rather than waiting until the spring when they're four foot tall and hard to kill, all right? Um, along the same lines, buttercup thistles, cool, other cool season annuals are already growing in most areas right now. So, it, Bottom line, it helps to know what to expect so that you can be proactive. All right, buttercup. There are about a dozen or more species here within the state. Um, the common are the hairy or the bulbous buttercup. Many of them are actually perennial, especially when we have mild winters. Uh, we don't get a true winter kill from those and uh, they will come back year after year from roots, many of these species. Believe it or not, uh, right now is not a bad time to spray if you're in the northern half of the state. Last year, we conducted a trial um, here in North Alabama, which I'll show you here shortly. Um, but using something as simple as one pint per acre of 2,4-D, you know, one of the two herbicides that I think we're probably most familiar with, or one pint per acre of Grazon Next, it goes a long way in the fall of the year if you understand that many of these annuals and perennials, the cool season weeds like this are already emerging. You know, there's horseweed, there's henbit, there's chickweed, and then there's the, the thistle rosette right there. So understand that many of these are already coming up. And um, 2,4-D is cheap. You know, four to $6 per acre is not a bad treatment at all. Whenever you can control that at the juvenile stage right now, rather than waiting until buttercup and other things are a foot tall in the spring, Grazon Next is still fairly affordable at under $10 per acre. Um, 
per acre right now. So this is a, a trial that we ran last year on the station um, where we just simply demonstrated that if you, if you apply in November, December, and I think we sprayed again in March with something as simple as low rates of 2,4-D, Grazon Next or Weed Master, we have good results going into the spring. And this allows our grass forage to emerge without weed competition better and uh, quicker in the spring. So this was an application May last year, December, mid-December. And this photo was actually taken in May. So about five months after application and that rate of 2,4-D at the very least is a really cheap option. And as you can see there in the strips, it did a really good job with control. And to note with that too, the use of 2,4-D at that time was really safe on a lot of our clover species, especially the established perennial clovers. So if you're concerned about that, 2,4-D uh, is a really good option. Here's one that uh, we often see in the springtime of the year or late winter, bull rush. Uh, it comes up in the low wet areas. Believe it or not, one quarter of 2,4-D is by far the best treatment that I've ever found on this Scirpus species. All right, apply that in February for most areas across the state and it does a really good job. You can use the ester formulation in the cool months of the year. And again, it's a pretty treat, uh, cheap option. The only other th alternative for a, a weed like this is to drain that soil because this bull rush, the rush species just thrives in heavy waterlogged soil, uh, soil with um, poor internal drainage. So, and understand too, that if you control something like this in a low wet area, there's gotta be something better that's gotta take its place. So if you look at that bottom picture, that looks to be an area that I would probably consider controlling because I look at the adjacent forage and think, well, if that bull rush was gone, at least I could probably oversee some annual ryegrass. Or for long-term solutions, if you're in the northern half of the state, we could at least have maybe tall fescue or Dallas grass in that site that would tolerate heavy clay or, or waterlogged soils. So again, 2,4-D in February, a really good treatment for that one. Dog fennel. Well, this is a good one. Uh, cedar weed uh, is probably what we're most familiar with. One of the most common broadleaf weeds in permanent pastures. Um, you know, many of us run a bush hog across fields like this once or twice a year. Pastures look really good after you mow it down when dog fennel is four to five foot tall. But what good have you really done then? All right. Yeah, you've set it back. You've suppressed it. But if if you bush hog, you're removing some forage as well. And since it's a perennial, it's gonna come right back before the end of the summer. So if you can combine some herbicide with that, it goes a long way. All right, this, my recommendation, I really like pickle ram on this. I know the PSD is a restricted use pesticide, so you need your applicator's license uh, to use that. But in my, in my opinion, it is much better than Grazon Next. Uh, Grazon Next is actually pretty weak on dog fennel. And, and honestly, the, the new DuraCore um, is pretty weak by itself on dog fennel, even up to 20 ounces per acre. So if you're using Grazon Next or you've already got DuraCore on hand and you just have to use it, you're gonna have to put something like Pasture Guard with it, all right? My recommendation would be to go straight weed master when the plants are young, um, you know, under 18 inches and actively growing, or uh, graze on P plus D, because I just think that the picloram is much more selective on this particular species, all right? Um, and the reason why I say wait until it gets up 18 inches is because you get more herbicide translocation. So there's a ratio difference between the, that perennial root that's underground and what's above ground. So the more you have, in essence, the more above ground growth you have to be able to apply herbicide to, the more herbicide than, can then be translocated to that root for an effective kill. Here's some infield pictures of Grazon P plus D that have been applied. This is 35 days after, after application and you can see 
uh, the dog fennel was at least 18 inches at the time we applied this. And to note for something like this, a field scenario like this, horse nettle is also in the mix. Uh, we had some pigweed uh, in this uh, situation. So getting all those when they're young and actively growing is really good and effective. And plus, if you can put some herbicide, uh, excuse me, fertilizer on this site after you spray, as the weeds are dying, hopefully the forages are taking advantage of increased sunlight and the, uh, the resources that the weeds were getting. Here's one that I wouldn't say is widespread, widespread, but I do get several calls of Brazilian vervain each year. This is an annual um, or a weak perennial. It tends to perenniate, especially through our mild winters. Grazon next or Duracore is exceptional on this species. Um, I would I would probably catch this when it's. Uh, 18 inches or less uh, with 1.2 to 1.5 um, pints of Grazon Next. It does a really good job on, on the vervains uh, and similar species. Understand there are some restrictions uh, regarding haying, seven day haying restrictions. Um, on the label, if you look at the Grazon Next label, which if you use any herbicides, I encourage you to read the label thoroughly. There's a 14 day waiting period before cutting and that's simply to allow that herbicide more time to do what it's going to do within the plant. Again, back to what I was talking about, uh, proper herbicide stewardship with the use of Grazon Next, use caution when moving uh, cattle from one field uh, to another, especially if you have sensitive broadleaf plants. Here's just some more pictures of the vervain. Uh, it's got a typical square stem. Thorny brush. Um, I know many of us face uh, briars, um, dewberry, uh, blackberry, probably growing up on fence lines, coming up in permanent pastures. All right. If you're in the black belt, for sure, there are the um, the rose species like multiflora rose, McCartney rose, and I'd like to point out the differences here. If you look at the top left, uh, it's a really good ID characteristic of multiflora rose, Cherokee rose, and then the McCartney rose, uh, many of which you typically see along fence lines um, and in permanent pastures. It, it can be really tough to kill, and if you think you're going to run a disc across that site, that picture there on the right of a root has been ripped up out of the ground and look, it's still growing and trying to put out a shoot even without a root. So these are really um, aggressive plants, obviously because of the perennial woody nature of its um, uh, growth habit. And here are just a, a list of general uh, herbicides that are at least they have activity on a lot of these um, woody type brush. Um, keep in mind that many of these options here have good soil residual. And what I mean by that is that herbicide remains in the soil, active in the soil so that the plant can take it up through the roots. That also means that if you apply too much or in the uh, incorrect manner, it can run downhill with surface water. So be mindful of desirable trees that may be nearby. It's important to follow the label. I'd say for just general woody brush, one, one of my go-tos is the Remedy Ultra. All right, uh, especially green ash. Um, it does a really good job. Pasture guard, surmount is really good as a um, fence line vegetation mix, and especially a lot of these thorny species. That, that's a good list to keep in mind right there. But again, I can't stress enough, especially when you're talking the use of Arsenal and Velpar and Picloram, um, that does not need to go anywhere near where you have desirable tree species or anywhere that that can run down slope. So please uh, read those labels. All right, the tough one, removing grasses from grass forage, what I think is the ultimate challenge. You've got foxtails. 
I'm sorry to say I don't have many good answers for foxtails. Smut grass. All right, can you tell the difference between smut grass and bahia grass? That's smut grass, that's bahia grass. They look really similar and they're hard to control. Crowfoot grass, crabgrass. You know, I think crabgrass is really good grazing forage, but many people don't want it in a quality Bermuda grass system. And then broom sage, it's another good example of a perennial grass that's hard to control. And you got uh, throw tall fescue in the mix that, you know, doesn't tolerate a lot of our herbicides that you can put in Bahia or Bermuda. All right, let's talk about Johnson grass. Uh, Johnson grass is an example of one, if you've got Bahia or Bermuda grass, uh, and even tall fescue, if you've got Johnson grass in this, Outrider is one that I think does a really good job of selectively controlling Johnson grass. And it is it's almost like this material was meant to be used on Johnson grass, but steward it properly. I got word from Aldot um, a little while back that three counties on the east central part of the state have experienced resistant Johnson grass along the rights of way. So um, generally Johnson grass is most susceptible at the 18 inch stage where it's just entering that boot stage. If you can broadcast Outrider at that rate up to 1.3 ounces per acre, uh, it does a really good job. Keep in mind with Outrider, you want that herbicide to sit out there without being mowed uh, so that that herbicide can work properly. Another good option is weed wiper, especially if you've got some height separation between Johnson grass and your desirable forages. Um, it's, it's very sensitive to glyphosate or Roundup. All right, I group annual grasses all into one because there are so many. You know, in the summer, we think about crabgrass and goosegrass, sandbur species, um, barnyard grass, crowfoot grass, our annual foxtails. And then, and then this time of the year, what's already starting to germinate is little barley. We've got volunteer annual ryegrass coming up, many of our brome species, our six weeks fescue. All right, in forages and established permanent pastures, we only have two labeled true pre-emergence options. And those are Prowl, H2O, and Resolon. Resolon being the newest herbicide that have, has just uh, been, that has uh, just received label this year. Prowl can be applied up to 4.2 quarts per acre. Resolon uh, is a program that can go out at three to five ounces um, fluid ounces that is per acre and not to exceed six fluid ounces in a 12 month period. And for both of these rainfall is essential. So in other words, you want to make sure that when you use any pre-emergent, it has to get out on the ground before that seed starts to germinate. And it has to be rainfall uh, incorporated by rainfall before that seed starts to imbibe water. Turning to smut grass, I, mean, I know it's one that many of us face in the southern part of the state. Very hard to control, but we have seen some success with Belpar. I know is it is an expensive treatment uh, that that not many of us can um, can utilize in our systems, but it does have activity. But I think this is one example of a grassy weed that you have to take a whole systems approach and it's multi-year it's a multi-year process especially if you've got thick populations a lot of work has been done in the in, in the university of florida system where they've looked at velpar applications uh, through weed wiper and um, looking at roundup through weed wipers i think there is a fit again you have to have some height separation there between the smut grass stems and uh, Bermuda or Bahia grass stems. So I think a roller wiper uh, has uh, seen some promising results in many of our systems, but again, it takes time. And uh, this is one of those that we're currently working on more options and exploring timing and um, you know, it, it's a really difficult one. Again, rain, uh, Velpar is one that is so active that needs good growing conditions to work like it's supposed to. 
Past phalum species, you know, I'll group these all together because they are difficult to control. And the primary two I'm talking about are Dallas grass and Basie grass. All right. If you've got permanent pastures, Dallas grass is a really good forage, in my opinion. You know, but if, if you've got quality Bermuda grass that you're trying to grow for hay or grazing, uh, there has been some success with the use of plateau or pastora in season, but understand that this often comes with damage to our Bermuda grass as, as well. Basie grass is the more difficult one to control. Right? Um, there has been some success with uh, the use of pastora, but again, I don't know how many people could justify the use of this whenever there is a high risk of damage to their forage. All right, so I'm beginning to look at options to use a weed wiper in these type scenarios. Again, the roller wiper, I think there is some success to be had, especially if there's some height separation there. And so we're continuing to, to work on that, but know that right now for basic grass, there is no good in season selective herbicide option for that. Brooms hedge is another one that I'll group into that mix. You know, I've heard all my life it's if you correct the pH, you know, you'll make the broom sedge go away. Well, that's not really the case. I've spent a lot of time working in the black belt region where we typically get soil pHs upwards of seven and a half. And well, this picture right here, for example, is in the middle of the black belt. And I think the soil pH there was like 7.8. So it's not just a pH issue. I think, again, this is one that is a whole systems management approach to control this thing. Proper soil fertility, I think, is um, um, part of this thing where you've got to sample correctly. And research has found that um, the addition of grazing and mowing with nitrogen applications have seen pop populations diminish over several years. But again, it's a multi-year approach. I do think weed wiper has a fit and we do continue to explore that. But I think, again, a combination of managing your cutting frequency, your fertility, your, uh, your grazing pressure, I think that combined with uh, fertility and, and herbicide use could be a solution. We just haven't quite figured out what exactly that combination is to be most successful. And here's just a, a good example uh, to be an advocate for the use of a weed wiper. Look at the height separation here. All right, so this time of the year, again, back to the, the visual clues for our weed control, we don't always know that this is out there and a problem until it shows up this time of year, but broom sedge has a huge height difference between Bermuda grass, Bahia grass this time of year. And as long as it's effectively growing, I think something like a weed wiper could be really effective. The last one I'll touch on is foxtail. For the longest time, uh, the University of Tennessee has made their recommendation as uh, one and a half ounces of Pastora plus eight ounces of Roundup, followed by another one ounce of Pastora 14 days later. And this is just in Bermuda grass fields. Um, it's, it, Pastor will control tall fescue and bahia grass, but know that it comes with heavy Bermuda grass stunning as well. And so that's just not a good treatment that I feel confident in. Even if we get 60 to 70 percent control of foxtail, I just don't know how many people are willing to risk their forage for that. Some other ones that we're playing around with is, are, are Resolon, the new one that just came out, and Dazaflam has worked really well on the annual species. Now, it's not going to do anything for the perennial plant that's already there coming back from root, but if you can get this product out before seed germinates and include that with good forage canopy, I've seen that combination work fairly well. You know, here's an example there in the, in the bottom picture of an application that was made in the fall. And, um, you know, we're looking at a pretty good control the following spring when we have good uh, forage cover. The other one is facet uh, L quinclorac. You can apply those at rates up to 64 fluid ounces. We've seen about three to four weeks worth of suppression from that. And if you bump up the rates to two quarts, you're talking maybe 75, 
to 80% control for about three months. So that seems to be as, at least as effective as the Pastora. What, what benefit we're getting with Facet though, is that it is a little more safe on our uh, Bermuda grass, Bahia grass, and uh, uh, tall fescue even. So it's, it's all rate dependent. And so that's some other uh, work that we're continuing to explore. Um, there's just a list of some things that we're continuing to explore. I want to end right here with this picture that I was really impressed with. This is a Velpar application made this year, April 1, as the knotroot foxtail um, seedlings were beginning to emerge. It did a really good job of controlling post-emergence, the annual ryegrass that was up, and then it released a really good stand of that Bermuda grass uh, forage through this hay field. So I'm going to continue to explore uh, more control for foxtail and some of these troublesome grasses and um, know that if you've got any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, email me or go to our website to find more information on any of our forage or forage weed control recommendations. Thank you for your time.